Okay, let's get started. Hey guys, Goran, how you doing? Good, how about you? Good, hey Suggest, how are you? Hi, good morning. Okay, audio and video are working. Uh, so let's get started here. Hello everyone and welcome. I uh, hope you're all safe and healthy. We have a lot that we want to cover here today in 30 minutes, so let's uh, let's just get into it. Uh, you know, tighten up those sweatpants and those gym shorts and drop in for an exciting session. I'm familiar with a lot of the folks who are joining today, but for those new folks, I'm Isaac Brown, associate partner here at Landmark Ventures. We're here today to discuss innovation in enterprise process automation. You know, as a lot of you know, over the past few years, a lot of enterprises have deployed automation technologies, but often with mixed results and questionable ROI, but recent advances in AI and machine learning have been major accelerators and adopters are really starting to see big returns on these investments, uh, finally. So, you know, today we want to just discuss some of these recent innovations and, you know, focus on how to profitably approach the space. I'd like to start by introducing our panelists. We've got Goran Kukic, Chief Innovation Technology Officer for Nestle, and we've got Sajnesh Gopinath, General Manager of Automation Solutions at USP. I want to start with just a couple of quick intros, and then we'll we'll jump into the discussion. So, Goran, maybe can you just quickly introduce yourself first? Good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Goran Kukic, and as Isaac said, I, I run innovation uh, for Nestle globally. So uh, I look at what is the digital transformation and innovation opportunities for, for Nestle across all the functions, across all the value streams. So we look at what are digital trends and technology trends and evaluate them through pilots, tests, and industrializations and implement where, where that makes sense, uh, sense for the company. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, very nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Sajesh Kopnath. I'm responsible for intelligent automation solutions at UST. Uh, we help organizations uh, look at AI and automation. How can they practically land those uh, in their enterprises and how they can digitize their business processes? We have our own intelligent automation platform as well called UST Smart Ops which helps you digitize the end-to-end -end journeys. So uh, very nice to be here and uh, look forward for the conversation nicely. Awesome, thanks guys. So I, I wanna start with the, <clears throat> the big picture question here, which is really, you know, what are some of the obstacles that have prevented automation from delivering, you know, the value that everybody hoped it would? Who wants to go around, you wanna jump on that one? Sure. Let me let me let me try with the with the first one. And I think that you already gave hints of the, of the answer already in your in your ten second opening. But but I think we can all all agree that this is still a maturing space. It is it's seeing huge advancements in in research on AI and obviously AI moving at the fast pace that it's moving today is is significantly impacting the automation and and making better and better products. Uh, but why is this? challenging it's it's challenging because in a typical scenario in a in a typical organization you would create a design of experiment where you would find an isolated use case where you would use a limited amount of data with a limited scope to understand would this work or wouldn't this work you know if you you would write an rfp you would invite a, a lot of vendors and see well okay let's let's put them against each other and see who's going to do the best but in this case, it's very, very difficult to do a proper design of experiment because you need a significant amount of data. You need to run AI on it. You need to train it and spend time to get to a point that it's actually working well enough for you to understand it, it, it's working. So it, it's exceptionally difficult to organize that in a small rapid test, typical three to six months testing cycles so basically, you have to so strongly believe in it that you have to go all in from day one, and then uh, hope hope that you that you made the, the right choice. So long long story in a, in a short answer, it is those projects, depending on the investment, tend to be tend to be high risk and and tend to be um, quite difficult to design and 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 try. Yeah, and I I concur with Goran like. Uh when we talk to customers right uh, who have 
considered some of these projects as failures. Uh, the the true aspect is what Goran said. They gave up too soon, right? Because you know these kind of things cannot be a time boxed uh, within a two weeks. War, you know, and and sometimes people wrongly extrapolate also, uh, because when you look at uh, AI and automation, if you don't approach it more strategically, it becomes more of you know you you can't take one use case and extrapolate and think that okay that's how it ever the entire universe will work, right? And that is why uh, this is more of a journey, as Goran mentioned. It's more of a journey as opposed to uh, uh, in, a, in a one-off exercise. And that's the difference. Uh, so you have to think a little more strategically. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think that's the problem for a lot of new technologies and enterprise use cases is people want to see that instant ROI, right, to become a believer. And it, it's just not the reality for most technologies, right? So I agree that it's a, it's a journey and an evolution as opposed to just a project. Um, now, I, I think one of the things that we're starting to see is some of the recent advances in machine learning and cognitive intelligence have helped accelerate time to value, and they've enabled some new use cases. Um, you know, Sajesh, maybe you could reflect on, you know, how, how are, you know, what, what are some of these advances in technology that have enabled, you know, new use cases, new time to value, how, how they accelerated the space? Yeah. So the, you know, the concept of AI is not new, right? I mean, it's been there uh, for ages, but the uh, what is happening is uh, people are looking at AI and machine learning more on a practical note as opposed to, you know, uh, historically we will he hear about, okay, applying, uh, it is uh, something that happens in an MIT or in Stanford AI labs, et cetera. But now people are looking at, uh, you know, how can you apply AI and machine learning to digitize some of your business processes. How can they be an integral part of that, right? So, so that is what is changing. It becoming a more of a practical uh, use cases are evolving out of that. And the other thing that is uh, really helping that entire journey, historically, uh, if you look at businesses today, at least that, uh, the digital businesses that we are interacting with today, uh, uh, the digital touch points have increased. And uh, you have more data and more insights coming to you uh, as an organization than ever before, right? And having that data, uh, you know, you have two challenges. One is you have huge amount of data, so it's not manually possible to make sense out of that data, right? So how do you distill between wanted and unwanted data? The second thing is uh, these technologies are able to give you more insights that coming out of that data much more powerfully and that application along with digitization of some of these journeys is where uh, you know aspects like for example right huge amount of data ex resides in businesses today in an unstructured format so people you know there are technology advancements happening on intelligent document uh, processing uh, capabilities that can practically take a lot of that insight into uh, into enterprises so that they can process a lot of that information right whether it's contracts uh, invoices, you name it. So, so that's just one example. So, the, so the amount of data that is available today, and the kind of technology uh, mapping those is what is making this more and more powerful for enterprises today, in my opinion. No, and 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 again, I, I mean, what I like to reflect is on what what's the innovation model and how how things are moving today compared to to two years back. And 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 I I strongly believe that today innovation is coming from from startups and uh, and you know today we use the word startup in a in a very you know flexible way from somebody who started a company in a garage and and a company that's about to do an IPO they are all still startups but uh, but uh, exactly as the suggestion is saying like in the past you would look at AI and ML and what's happening at the universities and well, what are the guys at MIT doing today that moved into 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 a mainstream so you're either going to work with some of the big traditional technology vendor companies if you want something really pretty and boxed and, or, or you're going to really look at the, at the bleeding edge of technology and you're going to work with, uh, with what is new and emerging. And for me, that one of the reasons why, why I sit in Silicon Valley is really to have that connection and understanding of where the money is going and where the innovation is coming from. And we have seen in this space, we have seen a lot of advancement. I mean, 
this space is so linked with the advancement of AI and, and quick application of that AI. And we have seen, you know, seen a generic advancement in, in, in AI, but we have also seen specifically for, for what can be used in automation from, from be better OCRs and, and better understanding of what you're working on and, uh, and, and really all focused around what you do with that, with that uh, unstructured data, because that, that, that becomes an issue. You know, I, I remember starting an AI journey and we talked about, do we really have the data? to getting to a point to we have too much data, it's just not structured and we don't know how to make sense of it. So I, I think I think it, this space is maturing and it's getting better and better. Yeah, and one more point I would like to add to what Goran said uh, is that uh, he's right on, right? In terms of there is so much of evolution happening in this space. So that's why when we also started this journey, we looked at more of an ecosystem kind of a mindset, right? So it is no longer like you can say that, okay, you put a tool and that will solve the problem. It is that space is so much evolving. You need to start thinking about it from an ecosystem standpoint on how do you look at the business problem and what ecosystems can actually deliver for you. Totally. No, great, great insights, guys. So I, I want to pause quickly and remind everyone that we do have some time scheduled at the end for Q&A. So as you guys hear what Goran and Suggest you're talking about, uh, feel free to enter Q&A questions into the chat box and we'll cover them at the end. Um, so I wanna you know, kind of just co come back to the discussion here and we've kind of hinted at this, but I think obviously um, people are a little bit disillusioned with the return on investment uh, in this space, right? But I think it's getting better and inherently anytime that enterprises invest in technology, it's to make money or save money at the end of the day, right? So you know, I think people are becoming more comfortable with the ROI proposition for automation solutions. But, you know, given all the projects that you guys have been involved in, you know, how, how can stakeholders ensure a positive return on an investment in automation technologies? How, how do you approach that? Who wants to jump on that? Yeah, maybe I, I'll go uh, based on experience. <laughs> uh, Goran, again, uh, uh, you know, you would have looked at it uh, at the uh, organizational level. So what we are seeing, um, what is shifting, and it's in a positive direction in my opinion, right? Historically, uh, people were getting excited on the technology, right? So, uh, you know, there's a cool new tech, uh, let's apply, let's see what happens kind of thing. But what is, where is the shift happening is people now, uh, and when we used to connect with enterprises, a lot of the time, uh, you know, taking it from that lab to practically applying at a business level was less and less. But now business leaders are really looking at, I need, uh, you know, my business itself is heavily becoming digital because of all the things happening around the world. And I need this to be an integral part of how this business, business is run in the first place, right? So that, that change in mindset actually is uh, evolving into people looking at what is a business value? And when we are engaging with customers uh, who are able to really land this and scale this at, uh, very quickly, what we are seeing is if you tie the business objectives, the KPIs, and what you want to accomplish to the automation journey or the you know the AI and automation journey, that is when it becomes very, very powerful. So we are, what we are going through is more kind of how do you structure and create a prioritized roadmap for these kind of journeys and then it becomes much more practical in terms of uh, landing. And so we are able to drive substantial efficiencies because of that particular approach that customers. And, and again, we see a close collaboration between business and IT nowadays, which is very powerful. And I'm, I'm pretty sure Goran will have his own views. Earlier, it used to be an IT, uh, oh, talk to IT, they will figure it out. But now it's not, you know, so we have all the way from the CEO, the CEO, CFOs and uh, head of operations are right in the middle to understand how is AI actually helping their business. So that that collaboration is becoming much more and stronger. Uh, and that is really, really powerful. And why that is what we are seeing a shift in value conversation as opposed to a technology led conversation. And I'll, I'll take it a step further. And, and, and I will say that I actually think that this should not be run as an IT project that you know automation projects need to be driven from the business perspective because this 
the technology and what you're trying to achieve is so much business driven and has so much impact on the business that you need to, to structure the project in a way that the person who's going to reap the benefits of the project is the one who runs the project. So when you create your business case, when you go into understanding of what are you hoping to achieve, that when you understand what will be the impact on the people, what, what are you try, what, what's the cost avoidance that you're trying to do, and, and what's the hard savings, and, and that's what, what the business will be after, that you are saving, you're doing hard savings for the business. So the business will be the one who's going who's gonna to write that into their p &L. So they need to write that. They need to assign their own financial controller that's going to sit on the project and make sure that you realize the benefits that you have, uh, that you have promised, promised at the beginning. And, and, and I strongly believe in that, that if, if you structure a project in that way and, and that worked well for us, then you get better buy-in, you get better support, you get better faith because, you know, people are more invested and then you will have higher, higher chances of success of that, of that project. The re I mean, I, I realize that as I'm saying this, this sounds as a no brainer and like, uh, aren't you doing like that every single project? We actually don't because, you know, all the projects in a, in a new or, or maturing technologies would not have such a heavy implication of the business because, First, you're trying to understand where's the technology, what's the viability of it, what's the, what, what can you actually do with it before you start and, and nagging the business and trying to sell them something on, on, uh, on something. I think in this specific case, I, I would not have to do that. I would go with the business from day one. Yeah. Uh, you're right on, Karan. I think and another thing that we are also seeing is that when we are driving such conversations, uh, uh, to your point, right, a lot of that ownership uh, is taken by the business teams. Uh, and it, it, you, you're right on, right? So they have financial controllers, et cetera, as part of the whole journey, not like somebody who looks at the projects at the end of the project, right? So that's absolutely correct. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think if it's an IT help desk automation use case, IT can own it. But uh, yeah, for, for most other operational use cases, certainly it's important to engage the business. So I actually, it made me think of another question that I think is interesting. Um, you know, we talked a lot about business value and it, it makes me think a lot about the business models that automation vendors are using, right? Uh, you know, traditionally IT vendors want to sell licenses, right? Um, we're increasingly seeing uh, more innovative pricing models that are perhaps va value driven, right? Value pricing models or, you know, value sharing models, I, I guess you know, suggest as a, a solution provider and go around as a, as a buyer, how, how, how do you guys feel about those kinds of, you know, like outcome-based pricing, right? Like I'm going to, I'm going to automate this process for you and it's going to save you this much money. And I just, I want to take a cut of that, right? Um, go around is, is Nestle interested in those kind of purchasing models? Uh, that, that's a good question. I think that that, that evolved over time. If you wouldn't have asked that question, three to five years ago, it would be a hard no. You know, it's, uh, you know, like it, it has to be fixed time, fixed price and tell me how much that's going to cost. And uh, and yes, we're going to negotiate the maintenance cost, but I need to know upfront so I can bake it into my business model, know exactly what's the hard figure that I'm going to get at the end. Today, that changed. I think that, you know, uh, we're moving to the cloud and, and it became normal to pay as you consume. So it, it became more normal to say, well, okay, I'm also going to, you know, share the profit as a percentage and so on. So I, I still think that, that there's a lot of opportunity for that model. Uh, it, it's not common every day, but I think that the opportunities uh, and, and willingness of companies to do that will, 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 open more than they were they were they were in the past the yes. challenge is still it's, no go, go ahead please no go ahead go ahead no, I said, like, the challenge is still that you know it's very difficult to to know in advance what what is the size of opportunity like if you think of a company of size of nestle and you think like okay i'm going to create a center of competence or center of scale for my payroll or for my uh, procurement division those are so big. Those are so big. You know, the size of the price is so big. You know, it's it's difficult to upfront commit that 
that you're going to share the profits and you're going to go with the with the savings and you're going to have with the model model like that but for everything else i think that 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 would make sense yeah so one of the aspect that goran mentioned uh, is more important if if you are you know the way we look at it is right uh, if you want to be a strategic partner for organizations to drive this kind of automation journeys the most important part is one of the uh, point, you know words that goran uses is the flexibility right so we as a uh, you know the uh, looking at from a vendor space or a, from a, a partner space we try to look at models in a more kind of a flexible nature yes of course there are more uh, more organizations are open for uh, gain share type models than before so but we also keep it very flexible right because every organizations has a way of working see sometimes what happens is uh, you know the the procurement process it might be a little more waterfall type and it is yet to be evolved so there there, there is a flexibility in which you need to operate so many times we even uh, has helped organizations to look at gain share with a cap so that means there is a little bit of certainty that you are not just unlimited gain share you know it's create uh, you know uh, a hard burn for the cfo right so yeah. so that kind of a uh, so that's why that flexibility to operate many times what we have done is uh, we have done baseline a current cost per transaction apply that as a new cost per transaction so there is a clear clarity in terms of where it's going so that flexibility of that commercial models is the most important thing uh, it is still evolving more and more projects uh, that at least we are running our gain share types but that is something that is still evolving and uh, goran is right you know it it is a journey we have to make all the stakeholders comes to terms with it have that trust built that uh, you know we are the right partner of uh, you know uh, that will walk the walk with them so that th- that takes a little bit of time i i six from uh, my point uh, standpoint yeah and i think thor on your reflection at nestle is is in line with what we see a few years ago people were not interested in those pricing models and increasingly across a lot of categories, not just automation, a lot of different enterprise tech categories. We see a lot of these, put your money where your mouth is, business models. And I think they're interesting and I think they will grow over time. Um, I'm seeing some good questions here in the Q&A. So we'll jump to that in a minute and you know, continue to encourage people to submit questions there. Um, just a couple other things I want to cover in our main discussion points. You know, one, one of the things that I think has been an obstacle in the space is just this idea of, you know, take Nestle, for example. So you work with an automation vendor and they're going to take a bunch of your data. They're going to, you know, put it in the cloud. They're going to build models on it and they're going to give them to you. But, you know, what are the data ownership, uh, you know, logistics? Can they take those models and go sell them to your competitors? I guess it's just it's kind of a minefield of AI vendors, cloud providers, customer data, and you know who who owns that data? Who who owns the models and the IP associated with it? And how is that structured? I guess how do you how do you do that in a productive way to to drive things forward and not just make it a non-starter? Well, I think that you know notion of ownership of data is uh, in, in this case in this specific scenario is not so is not so big what i mean by that is that you are working on the data that has been created in the past so you usually run into issues when you running projects where the data is being generated on the fly so you don't know who owns that you know and and any company would want to own the data or would at least agree at some kind of a, of a sharing data scheme you know so exclusive ownership on one side or the other when you're co-creating the data is always a sticking point. In this case, I think that you, you're working on historical data and I haven't seen issues where, okay, you're going to run your automation, you're going to run your models on our data. So it's our data, it stays our data. Uh, the level of trust, uh, you know, where, where are you running your models? Where is that taking place? It's obviously in the cloud everybody's becoming comfortable with that. You know, you're going to run on Azure, you're going to run on AWS, you're going to run on one of the, or you're going to run a Google Cloud Platform. It doesn't matter, but it's going to be run on a platform where majority of the corporates now would be comfortable knowing that that data is secure there. Okay, I'm, I'm not worried about giving the data to somebody and I have no clue what they're going to do with that. And, you know, and I see from us and, you know, running the cloud assessments in the past was a very, very tedious process where today, you know, it became so streamlined, like, oh, I'm running AWS, you, you, you're you good, you, you're good, right? But, uh, but then in terms of models, like who owns the models, 
I, I, I mean, I, I don't think I have enough knowledge to comment on. I, I personally believe, and and cannot guarantee that that would be Nestle's position. But uh, I think that as long as data is anonymized, and and you profit from improving your algorithms and creating greater good for everybody using the platform, I, I think that makes sense, right? But uh, but you know, as long as you know that's run on my data in my business context, I'm fine. You know, did that improve your overall capability as a company? Because you now on that anonymized data have a bigger, better algorithm. I would be okay with that. Yeah. And the, the, the you know, uh, Isaac, so the way, you know, to extend to what Goran was saying, right? The way I look at it is, it's, see, it's about just like any relationship, right? You need to have that, uh, level of uh, what you called uh, trust or it, there are some guidelines that we do. I mean, forget technology for a second, right? So even uh, you, you, you don't want to share the data or share the models as is and give the uh, the competitive advantage to your competitor. I mean, then that, that level of trust will be broken and the organizations won't be able to succeed. So it's important, uh, you know, Guran is absolutely right. 99% of the customers today are very comfortable with using, you know, public cloud. Uh, I mean, even cloud technologies in 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 a in a way, everybody is using it. Of course, there will be level of securities depending on whether it's PHI data and other things. So, you know, you have to have that hygiene, right? Uh, that is required. But beyond that, that is okay. Now, on the models itself, again, as long as you are not making it too obvious that, <laughs> you know, if if it is for the greater good, as Garan was saying. Then it is. That's how the comp we can also evolve and give a better service to you know. We are all learning collectively, right? So so you look at there are some still uh, there are some uh, uh, spe specialized uh, what do you call it uh, concerns so to speak evolve once in a while, but more and more people are more getting more comfortable as long as you have a basic understanding between the organizations and you use it in the right intent and the purpose people are more much more comfortable today in how do you handle the data so that's what we see i agree and i think that cuts across again all analytics categories Just four or five years ago a lot of people said i want you to take my data keep it in its own box give me my own analytics back don't mix it with anybody else's stuff and nowadays i think go around like what you said a lot of people are more comfortable with this genericize and anonymize my data set into your broader data set and run your models on it and if it makes it so you are better at delivering a service, you know, you benefit from that, right? Like if you're part of the broader data set and the broader modeling. So I think that that is something that is changing. Uh, I think that's a good way to think about it. Um, we only have a few more minutes. I wanna ask one more question and then we might run over just a few. I just love kind of bringing these things to life and making them tangible. So I'd love to hear if, you know, either of you could just share a win of a, you know, a rollout of an automation solution where there was a calculably positive return on the investment. So suggestion, I know you have a ton of these. Is there maybe one use case that you think is really illustrative? Yeah, so, uh, you know, uh, I'll, I'll take three quick ones, right? So one is definitely, uh, you know, in one, one scenario where we were able to bring in our, uh, you know, AI ops capability. So today, one of the struggles organizations have is uh, how do you, you get a lot of alerts. How do you, quickly correlate those alerts, be able to proactively uh, reduce the false positive, able to automatically create the tickets. Uh, and if you have a standard SOPs available, can you automatically resolve them, right? So we have we are able to bring that to life to many customers, uh, which is very, very powerful. So that becomes, a, you know, your IT operations become more and more effective. The other, other scenario is, how do you embed these kind of technologies as part of your core operation? So sometimes, uh, I mean, so a couple of examples where we have customers where we have done their uh, finance and accounting functions, uh, uh, you know, uh, accounts payable type function where we have applied this kind of technologies and be able to run that function in a much more cost effective way. So your things like invoice processing, et cetera, nowadays is 70, 80 percent of that can be automated quite easily, fully integrating with the ERP. And the, and the broader approach that I was talking about, what organizations are looking at, when we looked at it uh, for one of the customers at a more strategic front, uh, we were able to take 20, 30% cost takeout in a matter of uh, you know 12 to 18 months uh, because we are looking at that problem in a much more holistic fashion. 
uh, and uh, you know prioritizing those automation and ai opportunities uh, in a structured fashion so those are three examples that i can think of where you apply uh, strategically where you apply as part of a core operations itself and where you apply in a technology operation angle so from i mean i, I think i'm answering also one of the questions in the in the q and a but um but the biggest success that we had was with co uh, center of competence in our uh, in our procurement space, and uh, you know I can't say what 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 was the hard saving and and how much money that was at the end, but but it's fully aligned with what Suggest just said by between seventy and eighty percent. So we we consider that we got to a saving of four to one in terms of people F FTE full time equivalent full-time equivalent effort so basically you go for a four to one reduction but you still need to keep people to you know to maintain the workflows to to make sure that uh, that the solution is sustainable and 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 keep up the day training of, of what's happening with the new with the new use cases um so yeah that 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 was the biggest one we've we've done okay um i just want to cover one one of these q a questions and then i think we can we can jump. Um, I like this one from one of them. Um, do you see the pay on benefit operating model is more likely to take on as a partnership relationship matures over time or at the onset of working together? So I guess kind of in, in the way that you do those models, would it start out that way? Would you start out as a, as a typical licensing model? You know, suggest how do you see evolving into the game share model with some of your customers? So, so there are a, a couple of uh, structures that we have looked at, right? So sometimes, uh, you know, again, it, it is case by case basis, but uh, what we have done with certain customers is you have more of a time boxed, uh, a cost boxed uh, ex exercise so that everybody's comfortable with, uh, you know, at least at starting the journey, feeling each other out, understand that uh, what is the kind of success looks like. And once you have a better understanding of the landscape, because it's important that we say, so let's say we coming into a landscape, we also need to understand the landscape to be able to prescribe a more, much more powerful thinking, right? So, so before you go into a full, full on benefit, uh, uh, pay on benefit solution, sometimes that time box activity gives both parties a feel for each other, understand the landscape better, and be able to come up with a much more practical uh, pay on benefit kind of an operating model together. So that's what we have seen in certain scenarios. Uh, uh, and again, the other one is where the customer is uh, want to start quickly rather than waiting for a smaller engagement, et cetera. That's where I was suggesting earlier that one of the customers, what we did was we have a pay on benefit model, but with a cap so that it gives everybody a comfort feel that this is not like an unlimited checkbook uh, for either party. And then at least once you get to that cap, then both parties sit together, uh, you know, figure out what the learning was and see if it makes sense to continue. Yeah. Curious your thoughts go on and then, and then we'll wrap. How, how would you structure that kind of engagement? To feel uh, I mean, the, the, the re, I mean, I'm I'm going to share my opinion, but uh, but I think Sajesh was in a better, much better position than me to to answer this question. My, my logic, if you tie it back to 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 the very first question that that I answered today about uh, what is the reason that these projects fail, and and the notion that there's a there's a fear of risk, that there's a high risk and there's a fear of failure, I would think that it is easier to structure those projects at the beginning with pay and benefit because that would offset the reluctance of a, of a company to go and embark on that journey and try because they are afraid of the upfront investment for something that might not pan out. So I would imagine that you are better off starting with, hey guys, why don't you pay on benefit? So we're going to take a part of your risk. So we're going to put you at ease that this project is going to work. So we're going to be paid on benefit and then you know add the cap and so on and so on but then basically to to demonstrate that this is a this is a viable solution that this is a that th this technology is going to work and bring you the benefits that you're hoping for i think that is much better than you know if you go in with the upfront investment you're obviously hoping that the project gonna work otherwise why why would you do it if you are year or year and a half in the project and project is working 
now I can calculate. Now I can <laughs> now I can see like, do I really want to continue pay by benefits or I want I want a number? Now I'm, that that's the moment where I'm gonna say like, why don't you talk to my procurement and and figure out the model with them, not not with me? But now I have the data. Now I now I know. Now now I'm going all in. Now there is no more reason to anybody to share the risk with me because now I know if it's going to work or not. Interesting. Well, yeah, um, I know we're about five minutes past, so I want to thank you both, uh, suggest go around for, for staying a few minutes over. Um, sure. I really think the business model thing is so interesting. I think in a lot of ways, it's, it's the more important part than the technology. So I think it'll be it's cool to observe how that evolves over time. I want to thank all of our attendees who joined. I know we didn't get to all of your questions, um, but if you want to ask me or Goran or suggest anything, feel free to send me an email. You'll all get a thank you email later today that shares the recording. Um, and yeah, we appreciate everybody's time. I hope you're all safe and healthy, and I hope you have a great day. Thanks, thank you, everyone. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Nice to meet you.